Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Cheryl Oldham. I'm the Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Um, so appreciate you all joining us today as we continue our series of conversations about our newest initiative, Talent Finance, an effort we hope will spark a change in how we think about investing and preparing our workforce for the future. As many of you know, pioneering solutions to workforce challenges is a longstanding priority for both the Chamber and the Chamber Foundation. And over the past six years, we've worked with so many of you as we've built a number of initiatives focused on providing employers the tools they need to manage their talent pipeline. That is to build those real career pathways into jobs that are available today and the skills that industry requires. What became clear to us after working closely with so many chambers, other business associations, employers themselves, is it's time to rethink how we finance and invest in people and ensure they have the education and training they want and need. Which brought us to this week after so many months of work with experts across a number of fields. We released a white paper on Monday laying out the need for a new public-private approach for financing and investing in talent that is fit for our time, not the one that was built for the past. An approach that can address many of the challenges we see every, adult, every day as a result of a system that was not agile enough to meet the needs of this dynamic economy. The conversation today is the second in a series that is built around the major themes, guiding principles, and recommendations of the paper. The goal is to move towards action, and this is about building a movement and a coalition of the willing that is ready to implement new solutions and build the infrastructure to scale those innovations. No project of this scope uh, and vision can be done alone. And so I wanna just take a moment to thank our partners, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, who, will hear, who you will hear from shortly, the Greater Houston Partnership, who has been a longtime partner across a number of our initiatives in the workforce portfolio, and Working Nation. We couldn't have gotten here without the dedication and brilliance of all of these folks. And I also wanna take a moment to thank our financial supporters, JP Morgan Chase, Microsoft Philanthropies, Cognizant Foundation, Schmidt Futures, and Google.org. There really is a common theme across those organizations and that is a commitment to investing in projects that, is focused, that are focused on the workforce and ensuring that individuals have the skills they need to be successful and, and reach their, their goals. Shortly, you'll hear from my boss, Tom Donahue, the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in conversation with Johnny Taylor, the president and CEO of SHRM. I want to thank both of them for taking the time to be with us today. And finally, throughout the program, we invite you to offer your comments in the chat feature. We value your input as we continue to build on this important initiative. So thank you again for joining us today, and let's get started. Thanks so much, um, Cheryl. Uh, I'm Stuart Andreessen. I work at the Atlanta Fed. Uh, I direct our Center for Workforce and Economic Opportunity. And we've long thought that uh, there's a need to really think about how we incentivize and support new uh, public and private approaches to financing and investing in talent. And, and with everything that's happened today, now is the time that it really matters. Um, we believe that the approach that we are presenting can really help solve some of the, the challenges that exist today, including those that um, have long existed, but also those that have been emerging over the last few months and the need for agile systems that really move quickly to, to support new programs that support getting workers into jobs and helping uh, firms find the workers and skills that they need. Now, Cheryl mentioned that we released a paper on Monday, um, but we hope that everyone understands that this is much more than just a paper. We really see it as a movement towards a more effective and expansive and scalable system. Um, 
we hope that the paper and, and kind of the work that will come out of the paper will help offer new thinking, spur innovation, and help us think about how we can uh, create public-private partnerships that are more widespread, that are inclusive of underserved and underutilized populations, that help share the risk and the reward between training and, and education across the multiple entities that benefit from it. And we really believe that financing is the, one of the mechanisms that helps that to happen. Now in this new model, there's a role for everyone that's involved. It's not just government, it's government, it's business, it's education and training, it's workers, nonprofits, it's every sector that, that works in its own way to create uh, economic opportunity for people. We have to rethink the foundation that helps those entities partner. Uh, we have to rethink the way that we've long developed talent and the way that we've created mechanisms, that we can create mechanisms that help spread the opportunity and close skill gaps and, and, and close opportunity gaps really too. Um, we believe that doing this helps us have a more robust and competitive economy overall. Um, given everything that's happened with the COVID pandemic, this work is imperative today. Um, we need to find ways to help people bridge into new jobs to, to reach opportunities that they wouldn't have been able to before. And, and now is as critical as time as ever to do this work. Now, let me, let me pause and just say um, that we, what, what do we mean when we talk about talent finance? Talent finance to us refers to the development and the use of public and private instruments to align upside opportunity investments in talent development and education and training, as well as in managing the downside employment and income risks that come with working in, in the world. Now, we, we started with really kind of thinking broadly about how, how financing happens today and how it could happen in the future and how it ought to happen in a, in a really rapidly changing economy. I wanna talk briefly about some of the guiding principles that we took to this work when we, when we did it. It's public and private. It's not any individual, it's not siloed. We believe in shared value and risk that everyone's making investments and they should share in the upside benefits as well as some of the downside risks and that we need to do that evenly and fairly. We believe that new talent finance initiatives should help expand choice. They need to be affordable and fair. They're data-driven, they're outcomes-based, we believe in transparency and accountability. We believe they should help empower workers and that they need to be accessible to people of different means, different backgrounds and different types. And finally, any of these must be equity-based. We need to ensure that everyone is served by a talent finance system and that there aren't barriers that are artificial or, or create challenges for other people to, to get into some of these roles and training opportunities. Now I wanna talk about kind of all of the recommendations that come out of the paper, and I'm gonna put them into five kind of broad umbrella areas of impact. We believe that there should be public and private partnerships that help expand choice. We believe that those partnerships should really be private sector driven. There should be leadership and investment from the private sector in those. There should be skin in the game for uh, employers, and we believe that that should be shared with, with other entities. We believe that, um, Public policies need to help incentivize those partnerships that we talked about, that the way that we train and that we have policies that, that fund training need to support risk management, they need to support upside investments, and, and that there are some policy changes that'll be necessary to do that. There need to be metrics, there need to be appropriate risk scoring. We heard about that on Tuesday at our opening session of the Talent Finance Initiative. And we think that there are some changes that need to happen to help human resource departments better account for some of the skills and, and investments that they've made. This will all imply a new data technology infrastructure to, to manage and watch investments. Now in the paper, we have 27 different examples. I wanna highlight just a few and some relatively broad and high level ways to, to let people know what's happening um, and some of the things that we think are hopeful. But I want this to be an opportunity for you all to think about what we could learn more and how we could design new different programs. I'll mention um, the ASU InStride program, uh, which is an uh, 
entity that's really designed to achieve significant social impact through partnerships with employers and really to replicate some of the principles of the relatively well-known uh, ASU and Starbucks education benefit. They're looking to expand that and find new ways to, to partner across different entities. Now I'll talk a little bit more broadly. We also know that we have a, a federal loan uh, system for, for higher education that we could, we could really replicate some of the principles out of as well. So there's the income-based repayment experimentations that are very similar to income share agreements, which we also talked about earlier on Tuesday. But we need to find ways that you can align and braid the funding and employer investments and tap into to private sector innovations and, and public sector supports to make those, those happen. Thinking on this is early and there are opportunities to really design the future programs that do that. But there's also a lot of state programs. There's state tax incentives, uh, things that are very similar to economic development strategies that states and localities use. Um, there are ways to tap into employer collaboratives to reduce reliance on straight grant making or to leverage funding to certify and, and, and expand employer-backed partnerships with educational entities. And, and um, there are ways to use these, these programs to incentivize training uh, to, to hire and retain workers as they um, invest in, and cover the cost of um, some of the training programs that they're in. These are really just a few ways, and, and I encourage you to take a look at the paper to see more of some of the hopeful examples that we've seen and to let us know what we need to think about in, in the future. We're looking to really design and come up with new ideas. And so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Miller, by, with, in, in closing, I'd like to say that we really cannot do this without on the ground examples. We believe that there are entities that help our help create these, that are gonna push our thinking, push, uh, we hope that the paper helps push your thinking and, and gives some new ideas. And that's why partnerships are so critical, um, which we'll spend much of the rest of, of today talking about, and we look forward to continuing in, into the future. Um, Sarah, I'll turn it over to you now. Great, thanks, Stu. And thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, as Stu mentioned, you know, um, this has been quite an effort to get to this point where we are putting this paper out into the world and, and beginning to incubate some of this thinking. Um, but the Federal Reserve um, of Atlanta has certainly been a, a willing and eager partner with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, the Greater Houston Partnership and Working Nation to get to this truly jumping off point. So just to reiterate some of the pieces that Stu went through, we encourage you to take a look at this white paper. Um, you know, we lay out kind of the framework of for this new way forward, for this new consensus and a return to investment. Uh, within that, it, it gives you a framework for those guiding principles that we talked about, um, the recommendations where we talked about those high level umbrella uh, kind of categories, but deep goes deep into 27 different examples that we know about, but we know there's more out there. Um, and we know that we need to create more of those examples, which is why we're here today to talk about partnerships and a call to action. So if we can um, move to the next slide, we'll talk just a little bit about what that means for us here today. And when we say partnerships, this really exists on a number of different fronts. Uh, ultimately, first what we wanna do is identify and uplift the great work that's already out there. We know that there's um, demonstrations and there's emerging um, practices and early adoption of new financing mechanisms that, that lead with this public-private uh, partnership approach uh, that we wanna be able to bring to bear and we want to be able to uplift to the field. Um, further than that, we want to be able to innovate or enable rather more innovation and identify where those solutions you know, fit within into this ecosystem and how we can help to design those in a way that uh, is consistent with all of these guiding principles, namely those that are public and private, that have shared value and shared risk, that expand opportunity, they're affordable and fair, and create a more equitable future for those that have otherwise been left on the sidelines with more traditional financing mechanisms. Um, but beyond that, we need to actually implement these recommendations. And that requires a large coalition of partners to help with this enabling infrastructure. So we're looking to organizations and initiatives like the T3 Innovation Network to help on data infrastructure, uh, organizations like SHRM and human capital management around HR accounting principles and practices, uh, in Equus around um, uh, data and quality assurance. 
So that's why you all are here today. We want to tap into to your work, to your networks, so that we really are driving this coalition of partnerships that we can generate more innovation in this space and create more opportunity through financing to create a talent development system that really does meet the needs of our new economy and what we will continue to see happen as you know, the, the need for skill development continues to increase at a rapid pace and we can keep pace with that. So we will work with all of you to meet this moment. Um, it's, an, it's an imperative for our global competitive, competitiveness and for a new way forward for the workers that we hope to serve with this. So what's our ask of you? Um, you know, you're on this call with us today. This is the second of four or five uh, forums that we have and then action groups that will happen later on this fall that we hope that you will be active and engaged partners on. But we want you in the interim to tell us what it is that you're doing. We know that there's great work out there. We wanna be able to amplify that and use our platform to get these best practices out there into the world and to innovate from that point on. Uh, and then again, we do want you to get involved. Please do participate in these design workshops. We wanna be this, uh, this catalyst that helps to drive more innovation and to drive more adoption of these uh, innovations in the field. So we are here, we're a willing partner and working alongside of you, but we can't do it without you. That's why these partnerships are so, so critical to our work going forward. So I'm excited to turn this over. We're, we're gonna hear a little bit later um, uh, today from uh, Sherm and from uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and to talk about how their partnerships and what they see for the future going forward. But we thank you for joining us. This is the start of this movement. We need to do this last step with you and we're excited about the work ahead. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm delighted to have two amazing leaders in the world of workforce with me today. First, I have Tom Donahue, who's the CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Tom, under Tom's leadership, the Chamber has just done amazing things, including the real growth of the U.S. Chamber Foundation. But really, they've been at the front line of every policy issue for decades. And even this year with the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, the chamber stepped forward with weekly conferences about how to begin to get through it. And now with their, their new series, Path Forward, they're gonna help us get out of it. I would also be remiss, Tom, if I didn't talk because we both live in the district about your personal philanthropy. There is not a single charity in this area that doesn't lean on Tom and his personal generosity is, is legend. So thrilled to have you here. And we also have Johnny Taylor, another legend. Johnny is the president and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management, lovingly known as SHRM. Johnny's a lawyer. He's been an executive at various high level companies. And he was, and this is close to my heart, the CEO of the Thurgood Marshall Fund. Johnny has his full-time job at SHRM, but he still manages to be very active in the President's American Workforce Policy Advisory Board. And he's actually the chair of the President's Advisory Board on HBCUs. He writes a weekly column on human resources for USA Today. And again, my favorite thing is he's an Instagram star. If you haven't watched <laughs> Heads or Tails, you need to watch it because he's getting information to real people in real language every day. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining me. And Tom, I'd love to start with you. Um, the recently released talent finance uh, paper, which is the, the whole reason we're all together today, makes the case that the new economy requires us to tra transform how we think about our talent development systems, as well as how we finance them. From your perspective, in what way has the economy changed and what are the implications for our workforce and for our companies? Well, I think that's best thought about by looking at different industries. If you look at healthcare, the future healthcare business and treatment in this country are going to be supported a great deal by physicians assistants, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, specialists in radiation and in uh, lab studies and all of this thing. Uh, 
the first two, of course, require extensive education. But many of the people that do the tests, uh, uh, deliver the results in the hospital are going to be people that come with uh, uh, some testing at a community college and some uh, education there and, and special training to upgrade themselves in short times after they get in these jobs. Well, uh, how, who's going to pay for that? Can the hospitals pay for that? Um, can the, the students pay for that? Can the industries pay for that? You can look in a lot of other places. Um, you know, if you just think what's happened, and I'll give you an example from the chamber's point of view, in the last six months, uh, we were lucky. Uh, last year we got smart or somebody did and it wasn't me. And we said, you know what? We've got to upgrade. We have the best people on cyber. I mean, we spend fortunes helping American uh, companies and others who can't even talk about deal with cyber threats. But the big thing we thought about then was our own internal ability to communicate using all of these skills. And we had somebody there for eight or 10 months before the fuzz hit the fan. But what did that tell me? There are all sorts of people. We're just hiring a bunch more of them because we're going to be at this for a long time. Uh, because of the pandemic and because we're going to keep doing some of it. A lot of those people, they come with different kinds of training and they didn't get it from Harvard and it works. And, you know, and how are we going to fund that? How are we going to recruit the people? And Johnny and I were just talking about there's a, there's, and I'm going to stop and you can go to him now, but there is another problem. You know, John and I have comparable companies. I pick up somebody, train them, and get them excited about their work. And all of a sudden, Johnny needs a whole bunch of people at the next level, and he's going to be out trying to hire them. And these are issues that all are going to go. It's not only, it's not only the finance to get trained. It's the finance to get promoted. It's the finance to to, uh, you know, invest in the systems and the support you need within the company. We need this to be not a, a public-private partnership. There's got to be a partnership that is public, it's private, it's the people getting the training and providing the service to the companies. We're going to have more people in this you can shake a stick at. And just one thing, go look and see who the sponsors are. You know why? It's a big deal for them. And it's a big deal for this country. That's right. They're the ones looking for talent. Well, that leads right into, Johnny, what I think you're probably jumping out of your seat right now. What's keeping your HR, your CHRO members, what's keeping them up at night when they face these challenges? So, you know, it, you're right. I was jumping out of the seat because we talk about this a lot, even before the pandemic. And frankly, the pandemic gave us a, a brief reprieve, but there was a war for talent. I mean, and not just human beings, but qualified human beings. And they're literally, there are a couple of things that have happened, and Tom and you both know this, the American birth rate is sort of at a multi-decade low. And so Americans aren't having children at the rates that they used to. Couple that with the fact that, uh, that frankly, the Generation Z and the millennials aren't having children. I joke and say they have pets, right? So <laughs> here we are, a growing economy, fewer human beings or fewer Americans in particular, and you have this real problem. So pre, when we were at 3.5% unemployment, we know that 4% of Americans didn't want to work anyway. So we were literally begging people, no, you really should come to work. That's exacerbated by the skills gap. So you got a birth rate problem and then a skills gap problem. So even if you had sufficient people, they don't have the skills that industry needs. We as employers who represent uh, 300,000 members, 115 million workers in their companies every day. And what they will tell you is, yeah, I don't have a shortage of people applying for jobs. I have a shortage of people applying for jobs who are qualified to do those jobs, who have the skills that we need. And so I think you all, this, this, this panel is exactly what we should be talking about, public-private partnerships, because that's what's keeping us up at night is we're saying, okay, so publicly you educate people for 12 years or 14 if you do the K pre-K education, but 12, 14 years, you bring them through. Some of them go to college, about half. The rest of them don't. We need all of them 
in the workplace of the future, and they're not coming with the skills that we need. So we have a vested interest as employers to help education, the education system, as you've described it, that access to talent pay off for us. Well, you know, you bring up so much about the employers. People talk about government, but I want to spend a little bit on the employers. Yeah. We know today that employers spend between 200 billion with a B and 400 billion every year on training and retraining their people, including 60 billion of that, which is in tuition reimbursement. That's right. What do you think? The, the paper obviously makes a case that we need, and I believe this, public, these public-private partnership approaches, but where these employers need to play a role, because as you say, Johnny, they're not getting the people they need in the specific skill areas. So what are your thoughts on how the private sector should pivot here and maybe act a little differently? Johnny, I'll start with you and then go to Tom. So the trend is already there. The trend is our friend from a private sector perspective. In fact, yesterday, Tom and I are members of the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board, as you spoke of, and I was sitting next to Jenny Rometty, then the CEO, now ex executive chairman, chairwoman of, of IBM at the time. And what she shared with me was they're spending half a billion dollars a year on, on education, internal employee education. And she said, skilling up is, the, the, is what they have to do to continue to be competitive. So what do employers have to do? One, they've got to do more of that. That is investing financially uh, in their people, but also reaching out to the traditional educational systems, K through 12, as well as post-secondary to say, like, it's great that you're teaching this, but I'm not hiring for that. These are the skills that we need. And so employers have to reach out to educators, and we call it two E's, but the two E's have to talk. There's a real problem. You're supplying us educators, and we're employers. We're the, the consumers of your product, and there's a mismatch. So what, what we're encouraging, especially as an HR profession, is that industry and educators talk a lot more about what do you need the students to know and be able to do, whether they go on to post-secondary education or as many of our fellow Americans will do, they will be done a, a traditional formal education at the end of high school. And Johnny, how do we make sure, like maybe Sherm has a role in this, how do we make sure when the employers and the educators are having these discussions that it's a more inclusive audience of educators? It's not just, you know, I hate to use uh, easy things, but it's not just the, the CEO's alma mater that they're going to, but they're really looking for talent in maybe schools where, and they're talking about that talent development in schools where they haven't recruited previously. Well, as you pointed out, I formerly ran the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, which represents the country's uh, publicly supported historically Black colleges and universities. And so uh, the temptation, listen, I didn't attend an HBCU. I attended the University of Miami undergrad. And, and so my natural temptation as a leader is to recruit from a school for which I had a lot of pride and association and affiliation. And it's not a Black college, but it's my college. And so unfortunately, what happens is at the leadership level, CEO, C-suite types, we are predominantly majority institutions, top 50 uh, ranked institutions, and we just, we recruit from each other. It's a feeding frenzy. And what we're saying is we're leaving out so many other schools. I mean, if you think there are three to 4,000 higher educational institutions in this country, and we are all focused on the top 50 or maybe the top 100, my God, we look at all of the opportunity that we're missing. So I strongly encourage not just HBCUs, but other minority supporting institutions, minority serving institutions, women's schools. We've got to get out of that habit we have of going back to the group that we're most familiar with and we know mo most about. Well, you know, I, here, here, right? And let's hope that that continues. Tom, what do you think about uh, what are, what can these businesses do differently as they acquire talent and pay for that talent? Well, you start, and we always talk about talent because of the people we hang around with when they go to college, when they you know, and then there are lots of reasons that people are starting college at, a, uh, at uh, community colleges. And then there's a whole group of people that do things that we never think of. And they're more important to what's going on right now for certain groups of companies, for the military, for all kinds of folks. You know, the job that's most in demand, I think, in this country, they're welders. Yeah. Why is it? Welding's not so complicated. Uh, excuse me, 
that's the way the old welding is. That's right. New welding, that's you have right. to be able to read and calculate. You have to be able to understand chemis chemistry. You have to be able to weld different things together. And those people make a lot of money. Uh, the, uh, uh, the next door neighbor to us down at the, down at the where we have a little place on the Chesapeake, his father was killed in an accident. He had a terrible senior year, but somebody stuck with him. And he went off to, to a, um, a community college because he loved uh, cars and boats. And, and he became a engineer who was dealing with engines, first in trucks, diesel, and then in boats. And by the way, he now lends money to the relatives to get their mortgages. That's right. And we need, we need to, this whole deal that you guys were talking about, Johnny was talking about, that people don't want to go to work. Uh, they're not prepared to go to work. Part of the thing we have to do is stimulate them to go to work. And tell them what we have to offer is really quite exceptional. And then you got the problem of how we're going to help them finance it. How we're going to help them get the money they need, and there, are, there are more ways to do this than you can ever count up. The way of of suggesting that the only way to do it is to take a government loan, and after you get out to pay it back all the time, and no matter what happens, no matter what happens to the economy, no matter what happens to your family, is not the way to go. This white paper raises more the ways that, to think about this. We can have a constructive agreement between me, the, 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 the employee, and, and if I work for you for so long, you're going to pay this. If I get promoted, you're going to pay that. If you send me overseas, you're going to pay all of it. And there's great opportunities here. But And companies are starting to raise it. Companies, you know how a company runs? It runs on necessity is the mother of invention. Right. And they're all going through this uh, problem that we are having with, uh, with our uh, health system and they're in inventing new things every day. Uh, this country is, if there's one thing that we outstrip everybody on, just look at what happened in this pandemic. That's we right. started six months ago, plus or minus, everything we're doing in the hospitals, the emergency rooms, the critical care rooms, everything we're doing and using old drugs and new drugs, all of this is invention, 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 and what we're doing today got nothing to do with what we were doing six months ago. And that's what companies do. And what we're saying here in this paper, what we're saying and what we're talking about is, let us help you. Let us tell you what other people are doing. Let us show you some ways that you can use your resources you're, other spending, you're already spending and get a return on investment. And let me show you how to keep people by giving them a sense that this is a great, it's not only a good place to work, it's a great place to learn. And there is a future. Well, Tom, yeah. and if I could jump in there, it's yeah. really because you, you're talking about innovation. That's what you described, the American way. And, and it makes us what we are and the most successful country on the planet, right? We're going to need to apply that to the entire way that we think about higher education. And, and I think that's the problem. You all, this paper is all about systemic change, changing the way that we approach this all together. I'll give you an example of a company, and I won't say the name because I'm not advertising any particular company, but I know of a pretty large company that's decided, you know what, we're going to go to the country's high schools. We're going to find the kids who are really performing well, the top 15, 25%, whatever, the kids who are really competent and credible right now. We're going to hire them right out of high school. And the deal is we'll say to them, We'll give you X job as sort of an engineering apprentice. You'll work 20, 25 hours a week with us. You'll go to school the other 20 hours of the week. Over five years, you will graduate. You will have five years work experience, which is one of the problems that people who go directly to college suffer with is they have a degree, but no experience. You will have had all of your internships, your working experience. You'll have relationships with people who actually do what you want to do and you'll have no debt. That's the thing. We, as an employer, will then have a loyal employee 
we sort of groomed them. We're not waiting on someone else to spend four or five years with them. And then we come in and try and fix what we don't like. We were alongside them, helping them pick the right courses. You know, many of these students and increasingly in this black and brown population, majority minority population, they're first generation. So imagine being able to go work at an employer right out of high school, uh, also pursue your education because of all the virtual opportunities that are available. Online education now is not considered substandard for, for college students. And you can get and that, you know, you look to the engineer to the right of you and say, should I take this course or that course? Well, you know, the people who've actually been there because you can't go back home. Our children are different. Our children have us to go to because we're educated and we stay on top of things. But a vast, the overwhelming majority of America's children, particularly uh, children, minority children, don't have that. And this is one of the added benefits of think, just rethinking. The only way can't be directly to a four-year college, as Tom said, absorbing all of this debt oftentimes making very bad consumer decisions. You go to the, I, I, I got to tell you a quick story. So I was talking to a student just recently who went to college, graduated with an undergraduate degree, undergraduate degree in telecommunications and $150,000 in student debt. Oh. This was not an Ivy League school. This was an undergraduate degree. And you say, well, how could that happen? Well, the school was like $50,000 a year. Uh, it was the best ranked school the kid could get into. So of course, parents not knowing first generation say, you know, go to the best school that you can get into. If that was ranked 48 and this is ranked 75, go to the 48. They took on all the student loan debt, $50,000 a year to go to school. They parents somehow scraped up 25,000 financial aid and other resources, and they had to borrow another 25,000. So you finish this thing five years later because of interest rates, the person's student loan debt is more than what they graduated with the total. And, and so we are seeing this over and over again. And so people are becoming disillusioned. Now take that kid, that kid goes back to their community, a college graduate, full of debt, oftentimes living on a parent's bedroom, back in the bedroom they graduated from. And then the other kids are saying, well, college didn't pay off. That was a bad idea. I didn't see how that worked out for you. And so we have an, a, a national um, interest in making sure that we rethink the education and, and, and employer partnership. There's a better way to do this. And Johnny, your example, it goes right back to what Tom said before. If I go to a company and they invest in me like that, I'm not going to be susceptible to the poaching by a, right. a, another company. I'm That's going to right. have real loyalty there. So I want to ask you both a question. What, who, we, know, we know we need an individual to really make the effort. We know we need the business, first of all, to be in there. And we need an education partner. Who else do we need? Who are the other partners we need to really make these incredible opportunities available to everybody? Tom? Well, I'm going to, I'll answer that. But I just want to add one thing to what you were saying. And I'll tell you the name of the company. <laughs> Merck has got a deal going right now. Uh, now we're all working on trying to make more opportunity available uh, to young black people. He's going in to the schools and they're in a bunch of them and they're not looking for the top of the class. They're going down and looking to the people that are not only, they may, may not have great gra grades, but they're smart enough that they can learn the code and they can learn to do things in labs. And they're bringing, these are people that if they can make a good income at that, a fair income, are gonna be very happy to have that. And they're not gonna run down the street for the next promotion. And what he's doing, and we're doing some stuff with him, is just phenomenal. But why is he doing it, goes to your question. He's doing it, because all of his folks used to think if somebody didn't have a four-year degree, they couldn't do that. That's right. Uh, and he, uh, the, you, you know who he is. Uh, but his whole deal is to say, no, that's not true. That's a, an old wives' tale. And watch, train those people. Now they've been at it a while. And they're all saying, oh, this is, it's not that they're cheaper. And they are. But it is that they are, they are interested, committed, and loyal to this institution. They're not looking for the next deal that they can grab down the street. Uh, and I think what we have to do is look for the things that work. 
Yes. Why did they do that at Merck? Because they had a great big problem filling those jobs. And if they can't fill them, all the geniuses can't work. <laughs> and so the deal is we look at what the need is. We put our assets together, the company, the family, when we can get them involved, the student, the university or the school or the training deal, the government, the, the, uh, the everybody you can, the coach, we got to get everybody in this game because you can set it all up, but somebody's got to bring them. Well, and that leads to a really good question. Uh, when you developed years ago, the talent pipeline management system, you brought them. You, through your local chambers and your business members, really brought people to the table and had these kind of hard conversations and they've made a difference in communities all over the country. Tell me what you, you plan to do or what you think you can do to get this same kind of initiative going in the finance space, Tom. Well, everything we do, we work with state and local chambers. You know, it took, uh, believe it or not, I've been back here for 24 years. It took uh, a, a, quite a while to build the kind of trust relationship there that uh, when we had an idea, people will jump on because we said it's good. When they have an idea, we'll jump on because they said it's good. And by the way, we're in trouble, we help each other. Uh, and, and our plan is to go to these people because they all have the same problems. They have, it starts with their own children. They got too much loans, as he was saying, at a price they can't afford. They can't decide how they're going to get the right kind of education. By the way, when we talk about the top 20%, the top 10% of people in the class, uh, the people that we really need to work with, because those folks are going to get jobs anyway, the people we got to work with, the people down the curve, our objective is to put them all to work. You know, right before the pandemic hit, we were at the lowest unemployment rate in this country in 65 years. Now, this is something Johnny and I are working on all the time. Yeah. The deal is we are out of people in this country. Mm -hmm. Now, where do we get them? The first thing is if we can get the ones we've written off that they're not going to be able to fill these jobs like the people at Merck did, got them in, brought them in, trained them, filled their need factor in a very, and, and the biggest thing was convincing all the geniuses there that this would really work. And, and so look what we can do when we get to those people. Look at all the people that can come in and help in the healthcare system. Look at all the people that are gonna be out working in totally different jobs in the, in the manufacturing system and in the automobile business. You know, how somebody makes money with an automobile uh, shop, it's on the maintenance. You know what it takes to get good maintenance people? Because it's all computers now. So what you need to do is go get people that you never think you'd get. People that didn't think they could do that. That's and right. show them how they can learn, bring them in. And folks, and by the way, those are local people. That's right. Those are local people. And if they're in, in a job with you and a deal like that, that's supporting them and their family, they're not going anywhere. That's right. Well, Johnny, I think most of the attendees today are aware of the muscle of the U.S. Chamber and the local yes. and state chambers that they bring in. But they, not, they may not be as aware that you have your own group. Your, your local affiliates, your college, mem your college members. How can you mobilize them, do you think, to help us get this new idea of a new financing mechanism? So we're talking about it now. So SHRM, as you pointed out, 300,000 members, 165 countries. Uh, but in the United States, we have over 500 chapters, local chapters, and then they go up to a state uh, council type organization and ultimately here at the national. And so we are partnering with organizations like the chamber. Thank you very much for this partnership because we, we're HR people business people with HR expertise and you are finance and et cetera. We both have policy groups. We bring 
us together. We think together we're stronger. Where our local chapter, you have local chambers, we have local chapters working together. And we're really trying to see that. What we say, you know, there's nothing worse than, than the two of us not talking. And meanwhile, the education uh, industry, if you will, is not talking. So your local school boards, your local school systems, we're trying to bring us all together. We have the jobs, industry needs those jobs, and the educators have the pipeline. They are edu educating the students. So what we, what I hope comes out of this is a commitment that in all of your markets, there's a SHRM market, SHRM chapter as well, we get together and say, what are the creative ways to go in the front of the decision, decision makers? Tom pointed it out. Most of the, these are local decisions. We can do whatever we want to do sitting in Washington, D.C., Tom and I, but at the end of the day, all of these decisions are very local. Companies exist in local markets, sometimes multiple markets, but locally anyway, and I think we can do that. So I'm here because I'm pledging our footprint, people all over the country and every one of our good United States working together to figure out how to think differently about this. I also want to say one other thing, Tom's point about, you know, tapping into, he didn't use this language, I'll use it, untapped pools of talent. So yes, uh, when we think about future talent, we think a lot about high schools and middle schools and even elementary schools. We forget that there are a lot of people still sitting on the sideline who are adults. They're sidelined, uh, partially because they had a criminal record, made a mistake 20 years ago, and no one wants to hire them, partially because they're perceived as too old. And listen, if if 40 is the new 50 or 50 is new, however it goes, then we need to, people are going to be working for a very long time and we need them working because of the talent shortage. So older workers, those who are disabled, uh, we make all sorts of assumptions, especially right now during COVID about whether older workers or people with disabilities are unsafe to work or if it's unsafe for them to work. We have got to tap into previously untapped pools to, if we're going to solve for this problem. There's simply not enough children being born. And I started with that. And so that's where SHRM can come in, partnering with the, the local chamber and the local school system. Well, anybody who's been around you, and I have had that privilege with both of you, knows your commitment to diversity and, and, and equity, whether through race or gender, bringing veterans in, formerly incarcerated, giving everybody a fair chance. So I hope everybody listening knows that that's from your heart and yes. you put your work into that. Now I want to ask you, though, this movement that that we are committed to building. And Johnny, I think every author on the paper along with every partner is thrilled because we couldn't have a better partner than Sherm. Your commitment means a lot. How can the people that are attending with us today, how can they partner with you? How can they partner with the chamber? How do we build this movement moving forward? So it's real simple. Reach out to us. We're at Sherm.org. We have a membership site that you can go to. We have a senior vice president's name is Mike Aiken. I don't want to give out his email address because he'll be pummeled with it. But we have a, a membership group that will, if you call from Des Moines, Iowa, he will directly connect you to your counterpart in that local market, the Sherm chapter, and then you can begin to work. We're doing all sorts of research from the mother, uh, you know, if you will, mother, but the parent company here to make sure that we inform that research and we protect, give you good policy guidance, et cetera, but it's gonna happen locally. So I would just encourage everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and say it, send it to uh, Mike Aiken. If you're on this call, there are only 350 of you, he can take it, M-I-K-E dot Aiken, A-I-T-K-E-N at Sherm.org. He will ensure that if you want to get this started in your local community as a chamber leader, we want to get involved with you as a SHRM local leader, and we'll make this happen. Couldn't be better. Tom, how do they get involved? How do we build this movement from the chamber's perspective? Well, first of all, I, I take your invitation and uh, double it. We'll get together and do this in those cities. Uh, but I think it's very interesting, as I've been listening to Johnny uh, and, and I can apply this to many industries. The person now that has those jobs he's talking about is not the person that had them 10 years ago or 15 right. years ago. These jobs are far more complicated, far more demanding, uh, and, and need a great amount of talent. And, and the reason is, of all the things we've been talking about, where do we get the people? How do we keep the people? What do we have to do to afford them? How do we get their health care taken care of? All of that stuff puts, um, puts the people in Johnny's operation, the people that control your employment, 
control your recruitment, control your retention, control your problem solving. And, but this is true in local chambers. The yes. guy that used to run or the woman that ran the local chamber in whatever city you pick it 10, 15 years ago, <laughs> it's a different day, different industries. All this new technology, different demands, more complicated politics. Companies that are hiring, you know, they're on the board of the local chambers, are hiring uh, and from all different experience backgrounds. But they're hiring stronger people. They're paying them more money, but they want, they're absolutely more demanding of delivering right. on the product. They're treating them now like the good people that work for them. That's and, right. and so the, the real trick here is we have to take all the things we're talking about we want to do, and we have to figure out who do we have to go out and convince and get them on the team. We get all these personnel people on the team. They all work for the ones we're talking about, work for companies that make decisions of where they're going to put their assets and they're going to do things that they wouldn't do two years ago, four years ago, 10 years ago, because demand is forcing them to be more inventive, more, uh, more risk taking. And it's all about, you know, if you do it, you can compete. If you don't do it, eh. Well, there is no one hearing the two of you who doesn't want to join this, who doesn't want to be part of your team. Right. Thank you so much for joining us. We are out of time. Sadly, we could go on all day. Thank you both very much. And everybody listening, join us. Thank you. And thank you to you. You did a thank great you. job. That's you That's right. A phenomenal job. Nice. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our second forum of our five forum series. I want to pick up on some of the themes that were uh, recently teed up by our guest speakers today, uh, mainly that talent finance can, in fact, be used as a movement and a set of new tools to significantly expand economic opportunity in this country, particularly those uh, that have been historically locked out of opportunity. Now is our time. This is our moment. And a more equitable talent marketplace is certainly possible. But what we need to do is really focus on how we change the incentives and how we finance and invest. And if we do that right, you change the marketplace and you change the world. So we think there's, there's no time but now to really focus our attention on this, uh, on this problem and solution. Uh, and we think talent finance is going to be a very useful uh, mechanism and movement uh, to really move the ball forward on these issues. I did want to highlight as well that uh, SHRM and the Chamber Foundation will be collaborating this year on a new survey that will go out to the private sector. This survey will build on uh, many uh, previous surveys that have been trying to catalog how employers uh, have been investing in talent. Uh, but we want to go further uh, with this new survey and we want to actually assess uh, what is the appetite of employers and the private sector writ large uh, to really take on new talent finance innovations and to really explore more public-private approach. So we look forward to executing that survey this fall and we will be bringing those results to you as part of the talent finance initiative. Uh, as I mentioned, this is concluding uh, forum two of a five forum series. Earlier this week uh, on Monday, we released the talent finance uh, white paper, uh, which made the case for a new public-private approach for how we finance and invest in talent, uh, one that is truly fit for our time. On Tuesday, we had our kickoff uh, event. Um, today, we dive deep into the theme of partnerships, but you're not gonna wanna miss what comes next. So next week, we'll have our next two forums, forums three and four. Uh, and those forums are gonna focus on the finance innovations themselves, uh, as well as the enabling infrastructure that is going to be used to scale them. So we're really getting into the weeds now, uh, and we are gonna be hearing from a wide variety of partners and experts uh, and from the practitioners themselves who are going to talk to you about where the opportunities are and what they've been learning uh, from some early testing. But again, if we truly want to scale new uh, approaches for how we finance and invest in talent, it's going to take more than just the financial instruments. Uh, it's going to take a new enabling infrastructure that's going to be composed of new quality assurance systems, a new enabling data infrastructure, um, new HR accounting practices, and so much more. We're going to get into all of it. So you're not going to want to miss those discussions. Uh, each will be an hour long. Uh, and they will take place next Tuesday and Thursday. And we hope you could join us and share this opportunity uh, with your friends. Uh, while we're excited to be midstream in this event series, and uh, we're excited to bring these experts and practitioners to you, 
uh, we don't want to forget the ultimate goal of this. This is uh, a kickoff celebration that is really geared towards building a movement. That is the ultimate goal, to build a movement and to, uh, and to actually create uh, the change uh, that we aspire to create. Uh, so that is our ask of you. We want you to join the movement. Uh, we want this to be a network of action. Uh, we want to find the folks who actually want to pilot and demonstrate new and innovative approaches on the ground. And if you're already engaged in one of those, we want to hear your story. We want to partner with you and we want to learn from you. Uh, so we're uh, going to continue to build uh, momentum. We're going to continue to socialize this approach and way of thinking uh, with many other public and private stakeholders. But please volunteer. Uh, we want to get to know you. We want to work with you. We want Talent Finance to be your initiative, your movement, uh, and your brand going forward. So we've included our contact information there uh, from all the core partners who have kicked off the Talent Finance uh, initiative. And, and we encourage you to get in touch with any one of us um, and, and, and you'll join the team. Uh, so I just want to leave you with this call to action that the time is now and we can't wait to act. Uh, and like I said before, if you change the incentives, you change the marketplace, but it's going to take all of us to accomplish that. So my ask of you is to join us. Uh, I would like to conclude by thanking our partners, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Greater Houston Partnership and Working Nation. I'd also like to thank our funders. Uh, without their generous contribution, we would not be here today and on this journey. That includes J.P. Morgan Chase, Microsoft Philanthropies, Cognizant Foundation, Schmidt Futures, and Google.org. I'd like to thank our guest speakers today, Tom Donahue and Johnny Taylor. Uh, and then uh, most of all, and most importantly of all, thank you to our audience. Uh, without you, this would not be a growing movement. Uh, so we encourage you to get involved and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Please do share this opportunity with friends and colleagues um, and thank you for taking this journey with us. Uh, with that, we'll bring this meeting to a close.